Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Pettis. So welcome to my talk on type 1 diabetes research, A New Hope. We're actually doing this conference today that's Star Wars themed. A lot of people don't know that the original Star Wars was actually called Star Wars A New Hope. So there's the tie-in. Anyways, we're going to talk a lot about what's going on in type 1 research. And there is a lot of stuff, not just in research, but that's actually becoming available for patients to take in terms of preventing type 1, maybe delaying its, you know, once it starts, slowing down the process, and then maybe giving beta cells back to kind of old timers like me that have had type 1 diabetes for a long time. So let's get into it. So first we got to take a step back and say, what is type 1 diabetes? And I know you've probably been living with it a long time, but we focus so much on our blood sugars and our CGMs and our pumps and managing glucose that sometimes we forget kind of what caused it in the first place. So as a quick reminder and crash course, it's an autoimmune disease. And we have the pancreas here. It's, you know, kind of right here in our bodies. Um, the vast majority of it is actually for digestion, but there's these tiny little islets or islands in the pancreas that have all these different cell types that produce hormones. You have the alpha cells that make glucagon, the beta cells that make insulin. Those are the ones we care about the most. You also have delta cells and epsilon cells all in these islets. And in type 1 diabetes, the immune system goes awry. Here's a T cell. And we don't know why, but it very specifically and systematically starts destroying these beta cells almost one by one. He says, whoops, my bad, because it is his bad. We don't know why this happens. A lot of people think that maybe uh, the beta cells get mis misrecognized as a virus or a bacteria. And while these, these immune cells are supposed to kind of protect you from these other things, it thinks the beta cells are something foreign and just starts killing them. And this process can take months to years, usually happens silently. Chances are when you were diagnosed with type 1, this immune process started two, three, four, even five years before, and it's just a slow killing of beta cells um, that you don't know about until you're only down to about 10% left, and that's when your blood sugars went high and you probably had to go to the hospital. So this gets a little complex, but it's important to know because we have a new staging system of type 1 diabetes um, that gives you a lot of idea of what's going on in the body. So what's here is that everybody is born with a certain amount of beta cells and that it says 100%. So you got all 100% of your beta cells that are there, they're happy, you know, you're doing your thing. There's some kind of autoimmune trigger. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's vitamin D, celiac, you know, sorry, gluten exposure. We don't know. Something triggers the immune system and these beta cells start getting destroyed. When that happens, we can actually detect autoantibodies in the blood so we could know if somebody's at high risk of type 1 diabetes, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But at stage 1, we get these autoantibodies, but your blood sugars are still normal. So that's called stage 1. At stage 2, this might be, you know, a year or two years later, you still have these antibodies. They're circulating through your system. And now you start to develop some kind of mild dysglycemia, what we call it, meaning your blood sugars get a little abnormal after meals. Again, you would probably have no idea this was going on because you wouldn't be checking your blood sugars. You don't have type 1 diabetes at this point. And what we call stage 3 is when someone actually comes down with what we would call type 1. You went into DKA, you went into the hospital, etc. So it's important to know this framework because once you have this, you can say, well, gosh, once we detect these antibodies, is there something that we can do to stop people from developing type 1? That's really important. And then also, when people are diagnosed in stage 3, there's still 10, 20 percent of those beta cells that are left. So there's something there worth saving. So this just helps you kind of frame when people say we're talking about curing or preventing. What stage are we? Are we trying to prevent people from getting type 1? Are we taking people that are first diagnosed and trying to hold on to those beta cells? Or is it somebody like me that's had it for 30 years almost now and, you know, the beta cells are all gone, so how do we approach that? And it becomes different research, I think you can see, depending on what area you're trying to do. And this is how I think about this. So you have the kind of timeline. And you have stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 that we just talked about. And that's when somebody actually develops type 1. And then you have new onset. People that have had it just for a year or two that still make some insulin. If you have type 1, you probably went through what we call a honeymoon period where your insulin started getting produced again and you didn't need to take much insulin and life was pretty darn good. And if we could preserve that period for as long as possible, that'd be awesome. And then we got the long-standing folks who don't make any insulin at all, but we want to help all these different groups. And this is how I think about this. In these first stages, let's prevent it. We don't want people getting to the point where they need insulin. 
And the next group, okay, they've got type 1 diabetes, but there's still some cells there, so let's preserve those. And then finally, in the long-standing people, we got to give cells back or beta cells in some way, so let's say replacement. So these different buckets you'll hear about in the news, but it's kind of important to tune your mind to what area are we trying to address here. So let's talk first about prevention. And this actually happened to me, but it's probably happened to you too. So you're at a wedding, you're having a good time, and word gets out, do you know something about type 1 diabetes? The father of the bride comes up, introduces himself. He says he's heard about some new treatments to delay the onset of type 1. He's worried because he has type 1. He wants to know if he should get his kids and siblings screened, and if so, how would they do that? And you put down your rum and Diet Coke, and you say, well, there actually is an approved medication to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. This is new in the last year or so. It's called T-Zield, or Tepilizumab is the generic name. It's actually a 14-day IV infusion, and it's for people at risk for getting type 1 to delay it. So I'm going through a lot of kind of like doctor slides here, but I know you guys are smart and you're with me. So this was the study that got it approved. They took 76 type 1s that had two of these antibodies in their blood. They didn't have type 1 yet, but we know with those antibodies that they're at really high risk. They were randomized to either get teplizumab, t yield, or placebo. And then they followed these people to simply see who got type 1 diabetes. Did getting teplizumab reduce the risk of getting type 1? Did it slow it? And this is what they showed. So again, another kind of confusing slide. But what these lines are is if you start at the 1.0 in the top left, you got the pink line and the gray line. At the beginning of the study, 100% of the people did not have type 1 diabetes. And as those lines go down, it means that more and more people were getting type 1 and kind of got out of the study. And what you can see is that the pink is the people getting teplizumab. And on average, it delayed the onset of getting type 1 by two years. And when they did an extension of this like data, it actually turned out that that number was more like three years. So you can say to yourself, well, is it worth it? To me, yes. You know, a 14-day infusion, just one time, minimal side effects, delaying this by three years, it's, you know, three years of not taking shots or counting carbs. Or maybe if you're a kid, there's a big difference between getting type 1 at 10 versus 13 or 8 versus 11. So this is something that is available now that if you have type 1, you can get your, your children screened, your brothers and sisters screened, even your parents screened, and they can be eligible for this therapy. So how do you do that? The easiest thing to go is to do is to go to this website, type1tested.com. They can actually send kits to your home where you can do finger pricks and send it back in to see if you have any of these antibodies. And if you do, you should go see an endocrinologist, get referred to a diabetes specialist, or your, your, your family members should, and see if they're eligible for teplizumab. So that's exciting. First drug that we have that addresses the underlying condition at all. I mentioned that we have all these things to control our blood sugars, but this is the first drug ever approved that actually attacks the disease itself to help prevent it. All right, well, what about preservation? Just got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Doc, what do you got for me? Well, new onset, it's not too late. I mentioned that 10 to 20% of the beta cells are still present at diagnosis, and those can hang around for a couple years. Usually by three, certainly by five years, most of those cells are completely dead, unfortunately, but you do have that window to kind of intervene. And maintaining any beta cell function or any insulin production is a good thing because we know that people that still make a little bit of their own insulin tend to have better glucoses, tend to have less blood or low blood sugars, tend to have less complications. And again, think about it, if you went through a honeymoon period, life was pretty good then. Blood sugars weren't that difficult to control. You didn't have to be super accurate with your carb counting. Probably didn't get low at all. And imagine if you could just kind of exist in that state forever, that would be worth doing. So how do these studies work? Well, the closer you intervene to the diagnosis, the better. Meaning if somebody's just diagnosed with type 1, if the quicker you can get them into clinical trial, the better. Um, and you need to have some degree of C-peptide. So what is C-peptide? This is actually an important lab for you to know about. So on the right, I have a picture of an insulin molecule. And in the red is what insulin is. There's an A and a B chain, and that's what's circulating through your blood is, as insulin. And when the body makes insulin, it also has this yellow thing called C-peptide that gets cut off um, and circulates on its own too, in a one-to-one -one ratio. Now what's neat about C-peptide is it only comes from the body. So when we measure it, we know exactly how much insulin your body is producing. If I measure just your insulin concentrations, 
I might be picking up the Humalog or Novalog that you're injecting, and I don't really want to know about that. I want to know, do you still have beta cells that are making any insulin? And that's where the C-peptide test is so kind of neat. So if you take someone who's newly diagnosed, you measure their C-peptide, if it's there, you say, hey, look, you got something worth saving. Let's get you in a clinical trial to see if we can give you some kind of immune modulator to help you preserve that. The studies are generally one to two years in duration. They follow you over a period of time. Doesn't mean you're getting the drug that whole time necessarily. And you just do these C-peptide measurements you know, throughout the study. Did your C-peptide stay the same? Did it go up? Did it go down? Ideally, we want to at least try to preserve C-peptide. So what new therapies are in development? Well, you might recognize that first one. That's good old T-Zield again. So it recently had positive data showing. So it's already proved to help delay the onset of type 1. Now they have data showing that people that are initially like newly diagnosed, it can help preserve insulin production. So it's not approved for that indication yet because this is such a new area, but all signs are pointing to that it likely will be, which could mean very soon that anybody that's diagnosed with type 1 could be offered this as a therapy. They actually gave it twice. You know, they gave the 14-day infusion one time and then they did it again six months later and found that people had better insulin you know, production. So that's probably coming down the pipe soon. And there's a whole other list of medications that are kind of being studied. This is a very active area of research. And I predict very soon, it'll be when somebody's first diagnosed, we'll probably start using a combination of medications to see, hey, can we preserve these insulin producing cells? So that's, that's awesome. Now, if you're just diagnosed or you just have a friend that was diagnosed or, you know, a family member and you're like, that's great. You know, I have this window to enroll in a clinical trial. How do I do that? So the best thing is just talk to the endocrinologist that you're working with. Maybe they can refer you to a local academic center. Um, you can type in how to enroll in type 1 diabetes uh, studies. There's this thing that JDRF um, made called find a clinical trial. It's a clinical trial finder where you enter some of your information, you know, how far you're willing to travel, what your A1C is, you know, what you're looking for study-wise, and they can match you with some of these studies and you can, you can email them, you can call them. We actually just did a um, podcast that we um, just released on should you enroll in clinical trials. If you haven't listened to our podcast, they're awesome. Um, this one was with myself, Dr. Edelman, and then my research coordinator, what my main job is, you know, doing research at UCSD about how to get involved in clinical trials, what the pluses are, what the minuses are, et cetera. So this is something that you should definitely check out if you're interested in this. Okay, so we've gone through this. Let me get rid of this red thing real quick. So again, keeping this framework, prevention. We have t yield for people with these circulating antibodies. And please ask your, your loved ones, your if you have type 1, kids, siblings, everybody to get screened. Um, go to that type 1 tested. It's generally like very low cost, sometimes even covered, um, to see if they might be a candidate. It's huge. Then we talked about preservation, people that are newly diagnosed. Okay, but what about most, the rest of us? If you're listening, chances are you've had type 1 for quite a while, and chances are we don't make any insulin, so I can't prevent type 1, I can't preserve something that I don't have, I need to get these cells back. And I've heard a lot about stem cells and all this stuff going on, so, so break it down for me, Jeremy, what's going on here. So there are ways to give back beta cells, and I've kind of broken these down. So you can get a whole pancreas transplant. They actually transplant an entire pancreas. It's not done very much. It's very difficult surgery. There's not many centers in the world that like actually do this. At UC San Diego, big academic center, we actually don't do these surgeries because um, we just didn't have a, a team that was doing enough of them to kind of sustain it. So it's usually people that are getting a kidney transplant anyways and then they'll also give a pancreas transplant. So it's something to be aware of, especially if you do need a kidney transplant from diabetes complications, that that's something you can do. Um, the next would be then what we call an islet cell infusion. So you actually don't need a whole pancreas, right? I mentioned that the issue is just these little cells within the pancreas that make up less than 1% of the pancreas. So you don't need the whole thing. You just need those islets. And they are doing studies and actually now um, some approved protocols where you can take just the islets from donors. This is usually people that have given their um, organs, their organ donors. Um, they died in some kind of accident, whatever it is, and do donated their organs. You can distill essentially the pancreas down to the islets and infuse those into the bloodstream to actually live in the liver. With both of these, you need immunosuppression medication so your body doesn't kill these cells again. 
And that's probably the main downside. You have to take these medications lifelong, which does suppress your immune system, can make you at higher risk for infections, uh, potentially certain cancers. So again, this isn't something for the masses. This is typically reserved, and there are centers that do this, for people with you know, like severe hypoglycemia, kind of what we used to call brittle type 1 diabetes, kind of end of the road, not for the masses because of the downsides of the immunosuppression. And then there's these islet cell implants that we were actually just starting to study, where can we put, um, I have a picture about it, um, these cells in a device and then implant them under the skin to kind of protect the cells so you wouldn't need immunosuppression, but they can still sense glucose and secrete insulin. So that would be a way to almost pack us a package of pancreas and implant it where you wouldn't need immunosuppression. So that's a, like a big area of research. So these first two are things that actually you could get. The islet cell implant is something that's still in research. Islet cell infusions, I mentioned, this is just a picture of you know, the liver and they take either human donor cells or stem cells. There's a company called Vertex who now has a way of making beta cells in a laboratory. And importantly, these are cells that are kind of grown in perpetuity. So these don't come from human embryos anymore. These just divide on their own and you can make enough to give everybody with type 1 diabetes because you can keep kind of replicating them. So you can take them um, and then infuse them into the liver where they actually start living and they can secrete insulin and, and sense glucose. But again, with this islet cell infusion, you need immunosuppression. This is another thing that Vertex is working on. I mentioned the islet cell implant. Encapsulation is something else that we call it, where these devices kind of protect the beta cells to some degree um, so they can still secrete insulin, but maybe you could get away with not needing immunosuppression. And they're also working now on modifying the cells themselves so that you could ideally make them kind of uh, silent to the immune system so they wouldn't elicit immune response so you wouldn't need the immunosuppression. All areas of research. The very last area of research I want to tell you about that's completely outside the box but I think is really cool is this idea of gene therapy. And that's something that you've probably, again, like vaguely heard about in the news, um, treating uh, sickle cell disease or hemophilia. And there's been some real successes in these spe specific kind of rare diseases that might just be one abnormal gene. And the way that this works, this is obviously very, much more complicated than this, but you can package a gene, let's say a gene for insulin, and put it into a virus and this is a virus that doesn't cause disease, it doesn't make you infected, but what a virus always does is it gets into cells and it puts its genes into you know, our cells. That's how viruses in general work. But now we're using these smart viruses to take a specific gene and deliver it to, to patients with you know, whatever condition. Now in the case of diabetes, there's a company called Crea that's actually taking an insulin gene and they're doing this in, in not in humans yet, but they've actually done very good studies and cured mice and dogs and now in like, uh, non-human primates or monkeys. They take an insulin gene, put it in this virus, and now injecting it into lug leg muscle to get this, make the muscle start secreting insulin. So super cool idea because you don't need to take beta cells, you don't need to infuse them, you potentially wouldn't need immunosuppression at all because you're just injecting this into the muscle, the muscle starts secreting insulin, and all of a sudden you have a you know, leg muscle that's operating like a pancreas. So this is something that should be entering clinical trials in the next year or so, so stay tuned. But just the hope here is to give you an idea of all the different areas of type 1 research that are really firing on all cylinders. And we finally had some wins with t yield, and that might not now get approved for newly diagnosed people. That's creating a lot more interest in kind of research and pharma and dollars coming into type 1 diabetes, finally. So I think, you know, there's never been a better time to be in type 1 diabetes research, to have type 1 diabetes, because I think we are starting to get on the cusp of some real wins here. Um, so hang on. Uh, hang in there, stay tuned, and hopefully this gave you some, you know, inspiration that there really is a lot of hope um, in terms of, you know, what's going on in the world of type 1. Thanks so much.